When it comes to categorizing music, it can be quite difficult, considering these categorizations are solely based on our own arbitrary opinions. This is most apparent in the metal scene, not only because the fans are worse than the My Hero Academia fandom, but because it is near impossible to create an accurate catalog of the sounds that bands are able to create. Music, much like basically everything else in this universe, has the ability to evolve over time. Just looking at the evolution of metal music is astounding. It is easy to think of rock and roll music to evolve into metal. Same instrumentation, song structure, vocal style, to some intent. Let's look a little further back to 1918 and listen to composer Gustav Holtz, Mars, from his orchestral suite, The Planets. This piece of music has influenced music that we have all heard at some point. Everything from Star Wars, for example. But have you considered Holt's music to be a precursor to metal? Of course you haven't. Friday the 13th of February 1970, Birmingham's Black Sabbath released their debut self-titled album to the public. And goodness gracious, something sounds familiar. I was a medium-sized fan of uh, Holtz, the Planet Suite, particularly Mars in those days. And one of the days I was in the, uh, we were rehearsing and I was going, trying to play Mars. And then the next day, Tony went in and went. And that's the way how uh, Black Sabbath came about. Many consider this to be the birth of metal music, or proto-metal, or heavy metal, or doom metal. This could also be the birth of the musical hydra that we call metal subgenres. The decade following Black Sabbath's release became an exploration of lyrical content, expression, and of course, the music itself. Then, metal became a contest to see who could be the loudest, heaviest, and the fastest. This is where we find the birth of extreme metal music. Extreme metal is still a very loose way to describe music, as musical extremities still manage to create timbral, lyrical, and artistic differences. There are three genres that fall under this term that I will be discussing over the course of this video. Black metal, death metal, and grindcore. Uh, it is argued amongst listeners that genres like speed metal, thrash metal, and doom metal also fall into this category, but I personally think of them as precursors of extreme metal. The first subgenre of extreme metal I want to discuss is black metal. Being a genre that derives from the sound of thrash, Black metal follows more obscure song structures, timbres, and lyrical themes. Some characteristics of black metal include growling, shrieking, shouting, and nasal vocals, tremolo picking guitar, medium fast tempos, atmosphere, band members wearing corpse paint, lyrical ideas based on the occult and anti-Christian or satanic ideologies, and raw production value on recordings, which, in my opinion, assists with the atmosphere. Black metal came in two waves, and the first wave of black metal emerged in the early 80s, with bands like Venom, Bathory, and Celtic Frost. Metal music experts like Keith Con Harris, author of Extreme Metal, described Venom as the band that spearheaded the black metal genre with their 1981 album, 
Welcome to Hell. In comparison to bands like Dio, who used the devil as a means of artwork and lyrical themes, Venom took it further and made that their identity, literally saying that they are in league with Satan. Venom is considered the originators of black metal, the sound of Sweden's Bathory influenced a wave of black metal that would develop the following decade. The following wave of black metal emerged in the early 90s, as the death metal scene overshadowed black metal and faded out into brief obscurity. These bands were from Norway, of all places which listeners categorize as Norwegian black metal. This wave of music is the current archetype of what people think of when they hear the term black metal, and is what curated the list of black metal characteristics that people are familiar with. Some Norwegian black metal bands include Burzum, Mayhem, and Dark Throne. Now, there exists a deep lore within this genre that involves murder, suicide, and church burnings that take place amongst Norwegian black metal bands but I plan on focusing solely on the music. This wave of black metal uses the satanic lyricism that was established in the first wave, but intertwined it into the occult and the atmosphere of Norway's landscape. The production value of the music these bands produced was rather raw or lo-fi in quality. It is argued amongst fans that the quality, or lack thereof, are quintessential to black metal's identity. I mean, just look at the artwork of their albums. Black metal musicians didn't care about commercial success or money, but they cared solely about the music and the atmosphere they produce. Bands that have gained success have been ridiculed as sellouts by other musicians because it is not their idea of black metal. Following the second wave of black metal is where the genre evolves into something more advanced. Dimu Borgir, for example, incorporated synthesizers and full orchestras in their music, creating a more theatrical experience for the listener. While the music changed, the occult lyrical themes and vocal style remained stagnant for the most part. The music became known as symphonic black metal, and a wide variety of add-on subgenres became prominent as the sound evolved. I can't discuss black metal without talking a little bit about the genre's punching bag, Cradle of Filth. Why are they a punching bag in the black metal community? because they're successful. Cradle of Filth's frontman Danny Filth's passion for poetry and mythology spawned the music they created. While still observing black metal sound, Cradle of Filth turned the genre into a sound that a mainstream crowd would be able to appreciate. As the first wave of black metal came to an end, musicians strived to create a sound that was even more complex and heavy, and thus, death metal was born. Like all weird things, death metal was born in Florida. Now, believe it or not, the first band to be considered death metal was called Death. Death was formed in 1983 by guitarist Chuck Schuldinger, who was influenced by thrash and early black metal. Their 1987 debut album, Scream Bloody Gore, is recognized as the pioneering album for the genre. Some sonic characteristics of death metal include fast tempos, tremolo picking guitar, virtuosic drumming, including the blast beat, which we will discuss later, and double bass, minor keys or atonality, chromatic chord progressions, violent imagery and lyrics, growling, guttural, screaming, and shouting vocals. The vocal style of death metal is what is most noted when new listeners hear it, and most new listeners think of it as just noise, but underneath the guttural vocals and heavy guitar tones lies a complex genre of music that spawns several subgenres. The main sound of death metal is heard from bands like Death, Morbid Angel, and Autopsy, who are largely influenced by thrash. 
The music is very focused on the down-tuned guitars and fast drums, which propels the momentum of each song. While unintelligible, the lyrics portrayed by the vocalist discusses a dark subject matter like death and violence. Much like thrash metal, death metal does have solo breaks in some of their songs. The album artwork depicts death in one way or another, and uh, some vulgar and some not. While the genre of death metal is noted as violent, it is rather tame compared to what derived from it. This next song is about shooting blood out of your cock. I come blue. Do you like death metal? but wish it was more brutal, well, you've come to the right place. Brutal death metal is a subgenre of death metal that is, well, brutal. Much like how Venom took Satanism into their music, bands like Cannibal Corpse focus on horror and violence. It's basically like a horror movie put into a song. Brutal death metal increases tempo and complexity and lowers the pitch of the vocals, making them very guttural. Cannibal Corpse gained mainstream success between 1994 and 1995 after appearing in the film Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, as well as being put under scrutiny by U.S. Senator Bob Dole, who accused the band of undermining the national character of the United States. While Dole's intent was to shame Cannibal Corpse for their music, it didn't work out in his favor, as the band continued to produce music and gain popularity from the free advertisement. While Cannibal Corpse is the poster child for brutal death metal, other bands include Aborted, Suffocation, and Devourment. Now we're gonna slow it down a little bit, or a lot, but fear not, the brutality is still intact. Here we have Brutal Slamming Death Metal, or Slam Metal for short. Slam Metal is a subgenre of brutal death metal, and while keeping the same intensity musically and lyrically, some aspects are different. Common musical characteristics heard in slam metal are the slower tempos, palm muted guitars, breakdowns, and hip hop influence in the vocals and drums. The band Devourment is considered to be the godfather of slam metal. Other bands include Ingested and Vomit Remnants. Before we conclude our adventure in the realm of death metal, it is important to mention some of the other subgenres of it, but I wanted to focus on my personal favorite, symphonic death metal. Symphonic death metal, like symphonic black metal, is your standard death metal with the inclusion of orchestral elements. Some bands feature full orchestras and choirs in their repertoire, which makes for a fantastic listening experience. Some bands in this genre include Flesh God Apocalypse and Septic Flesh. Just like black metal, death metal music subgenres are derived by tagging on different adjectives to describe the sound, like technical death metal, melodic death metal, death grind, and more. Sandwiched in between the waves of death metal and black metal lies the final genre of the video, and one of my favorites, grindcore. This genre comes from the influence of thrash metal and hardcore punk. The bands Repulsion and Napalm Death were the groups that pioneered the genre, but it was Napalm Death that made it quote-unquote famous. Grindcore grew in popularity in the United Kingdom and was where the term was coined. Grindcore as a genre is rather difficult to describe in terms of sound, but in an interview with Napalm Death's bassist Shane Embry, he said, As far as how this whole sound got started, uh, we were really into Celtic Frost, Siege, a lot of hardcore and death metal bands, and some industrial noise bands like the early Swans. So we just created a mesh of all those things. It's just everything going at 100 miles per hour, basically. Grandcore music consists of political lyrical content, screaming and growling vocals, fast or out of time songs, very short songs, minor key signatures and atonality, and blast beat drumming. The blast beat is a key characteristic of grindcore, coined by Napalm Death. 
It is a line of fast 16th notes uniformly divided amongst the snare, kick drum, and cymbals. The blast beat makes a great addition to the cacophony that grindcore is. In layman's terms, what is the blast beat? Uh, well, blast beat would be the way I would describe it. I mean, you've got a rock beat like that and slayer beat. That's what I call the slayer beat, you know? And it's like double that. That's just like, I'd say it's just like a, a beat that just gets faster and faster and faster. But now there's millions of different beats. Yeah. With all the new bands, is like bomb blasts and all kinds of... I lose track of the, the many forms of blast beat that there is now. You know, but that was the original blast beat for me, the one, you know, the, yeah. there's the kick, there's the snare. Another key characteristic of grindcore is the short song, or micro song. Many grindcore bands have songs that are less than a minute long, and some even a few seconds. If you were to look at the track list for Napalm Death's 1987 album Scum, for example, out of 28 tracks, only three exceed two minutes in length. Also on that album is the famous You Suffer, which is a whopping 1.316 seconds long. The song was actually written as a joke amongst the band members, but has become a staple in their live performances. Some other notable grindcore bands include Pig Destroyer, Agoraphobic Nosebleed, and Brutal Truth. Believe it or not, grindcore has subgenres. They are usually add-ons like in death metal and black metal, but the ones I will discuss are what I call lyrical subgenres. The first grindcore subgenre is focused on gore and pathology, otherwise known as gore grind. Gore grind was created by Liverpool's Carcass. Their 1988 album, Reek of Putrefaction, consisted of gory lyrics, guttural, pitch-shifted vocals, and artwork depicting medical gore. While the project was created for fun, to disturb and confuse people, because everyone in the band was either vegan or vegetarian, the band was displeased with the final product. While Carcass's music evolved into the sound of melodic death metal, many bands today still play gore grind music. Some bands include Exhumed and Last Days of Humanity. The other lyrical subgenre of grindcore is porno grind. Yeah. Just replace the gory lyrics and fast tempos with sexual lyrics and groovy riffs. There's really not much to say about it other than the vocals sound like the garbage disposal isn't working. It's all toilet sounds. The grindcore genre, while having popularity in the late 80s, remains to be the most underground genre of the three discussed. I think it is important to mention that there is a festival in the Czech Republic dedicated to grindcore music called the Obscene Extreme Festival. Since it was founded in 1999, it has become the top music festival for grindcore and features bands from all over the world. I think it is also important to mention that it is quite the spectacle. In conclusion, this was my hopefully brief analysis of what consists of the genre known as extreme metal. This is by far metal's most underground genre, and I hoped I managed to educate more people about it to show that it isn't just noise. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have a splendid day.
calls anybody anymore, you know?